Okay, so again, welcome everybody. Uh, this, of course, is the combined meeting for June 3rd. And I see we have at least one board member present that I'd like to introduce. Uh, my name is Ed Feldman, as a reminder, I think most of you know me. Uh, Adam Cole's on vacation this week, good for him. So he will not be in today uh, attending this meeting, but I'm glad everyone else was able to join. Uh, Donna, do you wanna say hi and introduce yourself for those that don't know? Hello, my name is Donna Mensimer. I am the SEMA Executive Board Secretary, a proud SEMA member since coming to the county in 2005, and happy to be here with you. Perfect. I don't see any other board members on. I do not either. Okay. Well, if there's uh, if there is anyone else on that's a board member, feel free to introduce yourself. Um, and actually, I was just um, talking before the meeting started. Just as general advice. Um, it, always, if you're called in for an investigatory meeting, please, please, please bring your business rep with you. Um, you're allowed to reschedule that meeting to a later time. In fact, I just got a direct message uh, from someone saying, uh, good advice, I was unable to get in touch with my business rep. So I certainly apologize that if that was me, I apologize to you. Um, please feel free, things like that that are disciplinary or investigatory, generally I put in an urgent category um, so I'm going to again put my uh, cell number here. Um, this is the best place to reach me. Um, and uh, just shoot, you, you can even just shoot a quick text, right? And actually in every, every rep signature line now, they put their, uh, we all put our cell number. Um, and that's usually the best place to get a hold of folks. So please do uh, reach out and we'll prioritize that. And again, it is your right to reschedule that meeting if you're waiting business representation. The law says it has to be a reasonable amount of time that kind of bears testing, but you know, usually within a week, right? If I'm like, I'm not available for five months, of course the employer is gonna say, forget it. We're gonna proceed without union representation. But anyhow, we have a pretty, uh, well, I don't know if it's gonna be packed or not. I think a lot of it depends on how much discussion we have on the different items, but we sure have a lot of things uh, on the agenda. Uh, return to work information. That will be somewhat brief, but then depending on the on the feedback. Um, VTA aftermath and security, of course, that's a reference to the Valley Transportation Agency shooting. Um, classification studies, an update on that process, as well as a notice. Um, surveys in process and to come, there's a lot in process and I do apologize for that. Uh, budget process and spending, and then the auditor move to the CEO's office. So let's go ahead and get right in. Um, the first thing is return to work information. So as you may know, um, two weeks ago, the public health officer, Dr. Sarah Cody, stated that we were going to begin the process of returning to work. And in fact, she lifted the requirement to telework as much as possible, uh, as much as practicable, and um, moved us into the so-called yellow is it yellow or green tier, Don? I can't remember. Whatever the lowest tier is before there's no COVID. Yellow. Yellow, thank you. Um, and that meant that other businesses and so forth would reopen. Why I'm not going to have the crispest answers for you today is because there is still significant disagreement amongst many of the governing agencies. So what am I referring to? The county has to pay, any employer for that matter in California, has to pay attention to what Cal OSHA says, what the public health officer says on a county level. So this is for Santa Clara County. Many of you may live outside of the county and be in a different tier. What the state of California says and what the CDC guidance is, uh, Center for Disease Control. And right now, those are not all on the same page. So many institute, you know, whatever, if you go to a hair salon or a massage parlor, they could point to different regulations and make an argument as to why they're at 50% capacity or why you have to wear a mask or why you don't or whatever. So we're still trying to shake all of that out. In addition, of course, Dr. Smith is the head of the county as an employer and has sent guidance indicating that June 15th is the time that he's hoping that we get some addition, that not helping, that we will get additional guidance from the state. And he's not ordering departments back to work prior to that. Your department may be doing so-called soft openings to the public or things of that nature, 
but there's not concrete guidance at this point as to what must happen by a particular date. Uh, what is the only thing in my mind right now that is crystal clear, there, there, there are two things. One is that everyone is not returning to work today, tomorrow, or next week. The 15th would be the earliest that we kind of see a, a, a lift and return to work discussion on people who are currently teleworking or out of the office. And the other piece that is very clear to me is that we are in the yellow tier. And if you saw the e-blast last week, um, there's you can go to the state, the state website and that tells you what the restrictions are for yellow tier. Uh, so that's that's where Santa Clara County is at right now. There's some additional work that I want to let you all know. It's not listed here, but it's part of the surveys to come. Um, we're looking at a an enhanced telework program post COVID nineteen. Now at this point, we are in kind of a the an extraordinary version of telework where because of the, the disaster, right? The, the, the employer invoked its emergency powers and put a lot of people out on telework without going through the normal contractual process. Most of our members really like that, at least anecdotally. That's why we're conducting a survey on that. Uh, but there are some members who have vehemently complained about this for a variety of reasons, right? Because perhaps their spouse is working from home, their child is attempting to do distance learning. Many folk ch children are returning to the classroom and now we're hitting summer. Um, and also you have just various people's living situations. You could see for me, I'm working from home. This is, I'm in, I'm in my dining room. There are three rooms in my house where other people could be hosting meetings and we wouldn't get a lot of cross chat. Not everyone has this luxury, right? Many people are living in an, an apartment Maybe they share that apartment with some roommates that are working from home, as I mentioned, their spouse, their children. So just bear that in mind that just because it works for you doesn't mean that it works as a blanket solution for everybody. So I'm gonna pause for a moment here and take some questions. And then if there aren't any, I will talk a little bit about what the court did and how we might pick and choose from that menu of options based on uh, the survey results. So you can unmute yourself or raise your hand. Thank you, Stefan. I see you've raised your hand. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself, Stefan, and um, ask a question. So yeah, you mentioned um, the 15th as a possible date. Was that June or July 15th? Thank you, good question, and it's June. And that is the date that uh, Governor Newsom states, has stated, he hasn't implemented it yet, but he states that that's when he's lifting the statewide mask mandate. So yeah, June, June 15th. Uh, any other questions, Stefan, or shall I move on to Joe? No other question for me. Okay, thank you, Stefan. Okay, Joe, um, I'm not sure which Joe that is, but hello, Joe. Uh, is telework hybrid an option given their outbreaks in Asia? Um, well, Joe, I'm gonna ask, uh, what do you mean by telework hybrid? Can you talk a little bit more about that? either in chat or unmute yourself, however you wanna. I think I'll take a stab if he can't uh, get his audio to work. Uh, they're actually calling that at our department and I'm like, it's telework. It's just that the, de the department director is suggesting that we have, hey, we'll kind of do a blanket approval of up to two days of telework they're calling it a telework hybrid. Um, if you can identify these specific things, and then anybody who wants to telework more than that would be going through their supervisor and the director for additional uh, approval. I'm I'm guessing that's what he means. Yeah, and Joe just provided some additional clarification in chat. We says um, teleworking several days a week. So yes, Joe, um, that is almost a certainty post COVID. Now there's a big asterisk to this. If, if, if this is, I don't know if that's Joe Tasnek or if it's Joe uh, Coogan, um, both of you have a capacity, maybe it's another Joe, I'm sure there are many Joes in the union. Um, 
both of you, I'm familiar with your work, and I think you'd be able to telework multiple days a week on the basis of your duties. Here's, here's the rub. Right now, the county, and they're, they're shifting, and I'll explain what I mean by this shift. Right now, the institutional county, meaning labor relations and 70 West, the CEO's office, are saying it's up to the departments and the department heads to decide post COVID how much telework they want and they can go back to the old system with our telework agreement. I can post that in chat uh, at the end of later. It's a one man show right now. So I'd have to stop talking and go rummage through my files to post that. Um, so it, it's very likely that most departments will have multiple telework options a day on the basis of your classification. So there are some jobs, and I think we all recognize this, there are some jobs that are just do not lend themselves to telework, right? Uh, if you're a fleet mechanic, you can't phone that in, right? You gotta be turning a wrench, right? Similarly, if you're a janitor or janitor supervisor, you're very likely, I mean, I know very familiar with those roles, you're moving around the facilities, you're making sure the cleaning is being done to standard, you're making sure the supplies are ordered, things of that nature. <laughs> Maybe one day a week, you'd be able to do like some administrative work or payroll or something, but that would be difficult to do uh, on, on a, like say multiple days a week. Um, but but me, most departments will have multiple days a week post COVID and they've expressed that, that it's working well for them. I'll give you a couple of examples. If you are in TSS or SSA, both of those departments have announced that they are very interested in a robust multi-day telework plan post COVID for most of their employees. Flip that around. I know this is a combined meeting. There are probably some people here from the assessor's office. There are some people here probably from uh, County Com 911. Both of those departments have their department heads and leadership have stated gosh, we really don't like people working from home, but for COVID, we'd have nobody working from home or teleworking. As soon as COVID is over, those folks are all returning back to the workplace. So that's the extreme example where they're pre-announcing almost no telework post, post COVID. Okay, I'm gonna to turn to Anita's question in chat. For those that are on the phone, I'll read it. How will the county accommodate parents with unvaccinated kids? I am vaccinated, but my kids are not at age yet, and I worry about catching COVID on site and bringing it back to them. So it's a good question. Um, there is no legal requirement at this point for the employer to make accommodations for that. I, I think your manager or supervisor is a human, right, and is probably sympathetic to that argument. You would get no additional rights at least at this point that I'm aware of, um, where you'd be able to say, uh, what, whatever, I'm not vaccinated, my child's not vaccinated, I'm providing elder care at home and my, my mom or dad or whoever it is that you're helping care for is not vaccinated. Um, the employer can still require you to come into work. You would observe whatever safety protocols you need to, um, but it wouldn't be uh, a, 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 a reasonable accommodation eligible reason to say, I must telework. And for those of you unfamiliar with reasonable accommodation, we we'll probably should have a training just on that. But most many of you are supervisors and are probably familiar with that. Uh, let me know if you have any follow-up questions, um, Anita, but I hope that answers it. Uh, also, if your role lends itself to teleworking, um, based on your department, you should be able to continue to telework to a significant degree post-COVID. But again, the, the employer would be able to say, I need you in Friday, because that's when we have our staff meetings and I need you in Wednesday to check in with the clients or whatever it might be. And they would be lawfully able to require that. Uh, Joe, are we required to wear face masks or face shield when we work in the office? If we decide to wear them in the office to protect family members at home who haven't been vaccinated, do that. Okay, so the, let me answer the first part of that section, that question first, because that's the clearest. Are we allowed to wear face masks at work? Absolutely. And that applies now and it applies post the 15th, uh, whatever additional guidance comes the 15th of this month, June 15th. Um, you are allowed to wear them in the workplace. 
that's probably, I would guess that's here to stay as a social norm and as a legal norm, you would be allowed to wear, you know, a face mask that you can still see your face and so forth. Um, so yes, you're absolutely allowed to do that. It would be inappropriate and unlawful if your boss, manager, director, or whatever said, I don't like you wearing face masks, take that off. They can't do that. You're, you're legally entitled to. The first portion of that, are we required to wear face masks or face shield when we work in the office? As of now, the answer to that is yes. What is in process, and I'm probably getting ahead of ahead of what's going on because the county hasn't come up with guidance, but I can share with you some of the conversations that have happened. You will have to, um, sorry, I need to scroll back up. Uh, are we aware of the office? Likely after the 15th, and this again, this is in the discussion part, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of where the county is. They discussed, well, what do we do with people who are either unvaccinated or declined to stay? And the answer is, is that they will probably be treated all as unvaccinated. So for departments that can accommodate this, there will likely be a vaccinated area or workspace where you will not have to social distance or wear a mask. And then there will be an area for people that are vaccinated or, or excuse me, unvaccinated or declined to state, and they'll have to maintain the safety protocols of the distance, social distancing, as well as wearing a mask. In a way, if anybody here works at the hospital, it's sort of similar to if you're a care provider and you choose not to get the flu shot, then you know you have to wear the mask, um, even though you, even in areas of the hospital that you perhaps otherwise wouldn't if you uh, did get the vaccine. So that's a, a what I'd call a very likely outcome from the county, but I want to be clear that is not policy yet. That's the discussion. Let me know in chat, Joe, if that answers your question. I have another direct message here. Um, let me see if, uh, let me read this. Give me one moment, please. Yes. Okay. So here's here's the, the question. Um, they can't talk publicly because they're in a different different meeting. Unfortunately, lots of people are in that situation, right? You're zooming on multiple meetings or whatever, which is terrible. Please stop doing that. I'm, it's always frustrating when I'm in a meeting with someone. I'm like, so are you going to be able to provide blah, blah, blah? And they're like, wait, what? What was the question? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm in another meeting. So um, the ask is, is SEMA they don't use the word lobby, but is SEMA providing telework options to the board? I'm assuming that's a reference to the Board of Supervisors. Yes, we've already begun that lobbying effort. Um, we have uh, spoken with the board. We haven't prepared a white paper on it yet. And we've spoken with Jeff, uh, Dr. Smith, Jeff Smith, as well as labor relations. We are pushing for as many options as possible. We absolutely don't want a mandate like was floated at the court by court administration over there where people were required to telework, but the more options we can get, the better. I believe that those results, that that push has already yielded results because initially labor relations and Jeff were saying departments choose. And I said, look guys, if you take this position and just say departments get to choose, we're gonna have a real checkered board of implementation. And there's not gonna be central guidance about what to do if we're doing hoteling spaces or you know, remote work on a longer term basis and equipping departments to handle that as well as assess the productivity of, of remote folks. So now we're seeing that labor relations is developing a policy. I don't know what that policy is because I haven't seen it or been involved in those discussions yet but I believe that there will be a central guidance concerning that. So long answer provided just now, short answer is yes, SEMA believes that this is a priority and will understand more of those priorities um, once we complete the survey. Okay, I, uh, several, five more direct messages just came in and three more in chat. I'm gonna give five more minutes to this topic. I realize a lot of people have questions about it. Um, and if you can share share your questions with everybody, so that so that everyone can at least see what's going on, um, I'm I'm going to get through as many of these questions as I can. Uh, okay, is there any discussion on up? This is from Ashley. 
Is there any discussion on updating the telework policy to encourage individuals to telework if they are feeling ill? In the past, a lot of people would still come to work if they were sick. So yes, um, I, I th that's absolutely correct, Ashley. So there are two pieces here. One, <laughs> if you're sick, just please call in sick, right? I, re I say that and I'm a hypocrite because I end up working when I'm sick. But if you at all possible, you can call in sick. If for whatever reason you can't and you gotta go to you know attend that meeting or whatever, then by all means, please telework. So that's a great suggestion and we'll, we will incorporate that in our asks of labor relations on the board. We haven't specifically asked that yet. Pami uh, speak, come and speak for itself. I have several direct messages here. What is the county's stance on the EEOC's statement on mandating the vaccine to return to work? I am unfamiliar with a mandate. Um, I am familiar with a recommendation. And actually that raises a really good question uh, or, or this question has been posed to me. Can I, as a manager or supervisor or even just a SEMA member, tell a colleague to get a vaccine? The answer to that is no. You can't direct someone to go get a vaccine. However, you can share your opinion that you encourage all staff to adhere to the Center for Disease Control recommendation as well as the public health officer's recommendation to get vaccinated and provide employees with that information, right? Look, here's a list of places you can go and whatever. Obviously, you don't want to just go to one person's desk and hang out there and tell them about it for an hour. But, you know, sending general reminders with emails or mentioning it at every staff meeting is, is for a few weeks or something is fine. Uh, another question, would you be able to move teams? Would you be able to move teams if certain manager allows more remote days? Oh, Oh, I see. So I, I, I'm interpreting this question to be, let's say you work on team A and that manager says one day maximum telework. Team B across the hall has three days telework. Can you move teams? Can you? Yes. Are you entitled to or do you have a right to? No. So you'd have to make a request or uh, to transfer teams and that would be handled administratively uh, within the department whether or not you transfer teams you always retain the ability to apply for open positions that could be housed in a different team. Thank you for the information, Donna. I'm gonna handle the, I'm gonna look at these two public ones and I, I apologize for the direct ones. If we have time at the end of the meeting, I'll return to this topic. Obviously a hot topic here. Are facilities departments required to change augment existing HVAC systems to prevent spreading bad air from areas designated? Yes, they are. So thank you for the question, Phil. Um, unfortunately, the guidance is not, the, it's not a guidance, it's requirement. The requirement is not adequately, funded is the wrong word. I, I think there's, there's an inadequate understanding and expertise of the HVAC systems throughout the county. Let me put it that way. So, you know, you have some facilities manager and they're presented with a document that says, make sure that the, and I'm going to screw up all the, the terms, you know, that the fan motor is operating at a certain speed, make sure that the particulate filter has been cycled out, et cetera, et cetera. And there are these guidelines. And from what I understand, people that are not super knowledgeable about these topics are being asked to sign off on it. So that they, there is a requirement to prevent sick buildings as you describe, I am not sure that that's adequately being done. Um, in fact, let me, I'm putting that on my whip to do is um, to follow up on. Okay. And then uh, Teresa or Teresa, depending on the pronunciation of your name, and then I'll move on to the next topic. Uh, so what are our rights if we need to attend a meeting in the conference room and we discover that nobody is wearing face masks and doing social distancing? I assume you mean that they're not social distancing, that nobody is social distancing or wearing the face mask. Okay, uh, what are your rights? So today it's, it's a requirement 
that you would wear a face mask and social distance. Um, post the 15th, I'd be speculating, right? Uh, and this question was not asked earlier. Um, what are right? So you would be able to say, look, every, uh, hey, man, I'm wearing my face mask. Everybody needs to put on a mask. You, you would be able to insist on that. If they didn't, then you could excuse yourself or attend the meeting remotely uh, and, and give your rep a call as well, because that shouldn't be happening. Follow-up question, how can we use the break room when everyone is almost on the same lunch break? I don't know. The, 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 that's the guidance. The guidance is you're allowed to eat without your mask on. Obviously, you can't with your mask on, just like you. the restaurants are, are reopening and you're allowed to eat in the dining room indoors and outdoors. Um, so that's not a violation of the law or of the guidance. So if you feel uncomfortable, then you'd have to find somewhere else to eat. Uh, but that's completely allowed right now. So the first portion of your question, uh, you're you're allowed to require people, uh, demand that people. I mean, you know, you want to be friendly about it, but hey, please make please wear your mask. That's what we've been told to do, um, or attend remotely if people can't or won't. It's really up to the manager to make sure that happens. Uh, break room, there's nothing that can be done. That's perfectly legitimate for people to sit in the break room, um, or near the lunch room area or whatever it might be, and 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 eat. Okay, well, a lot of information there. Thank you for all the questions. Great questions, everybody. Great questions. Okay, uh, VTA math, uh, aftermath and security. Okay, so um, first off, thank you to the, uh, we had, we had you know, not very many members. I only saw maybe eight SEMA members that showed up to the VTA vigil. Thank you, nice to see a few people out. Thank you for attending. Um, so some information about that. Uh, the, the, the shooting and the aftermath. Uh, I know a lot of people were on edge and likely still are. Um, before I get into that, I want to thank all of the SEMA folk, county folks particularly, but especially SEMA folks that were first responders to that. And I'm talking about if there are people here that are from the coroner's office or, you know, EMS um, and, and out at the hospital, like stellar work. I know it's not... Um, it's not something anybody wants to do uh, to respond to that kind of an incident, but you all did a really phenomenal job and it certainly was noticed. So thank you to everybody for that. With regards to security, SEMA institutionally is going to be taking a more aggressive stance on this. And some of our board members have experienced this. I'm sure some of you have as well in the audience. Um, there are individuals who have been, I've witnessed this as a, as a rep, who have been disciplined um, or put on uh, fitness for duty examinations uh, because they've made threats, right? They've threatened coworkers, um, either on social media or verbally or you know, out on the work site, perhaps, if it's, if it's like a, the type of position that deploys to a place like our maintenance crews or, or roads workers, something. And, that's wholly inappropriate. And we've had somewhat lackluster response from labor relations in the past on this, where they've said, oh, well, you know, we got to investigate this, but um, we're putting the person back in the, in the office in the meantime, or we're putting the person back in the, the area. And that's created a lot of problems and, and, and tension. Um, I realize this doesn't apply to most of the folks on this call, but there are Plenty of county employees where, you know, carrying a weapon is second nature, right? Either because they're in locked facilities like probation, uh, APD, JPD, out at the ranches, over at the jail, um, you know, and so they have weapons on them, whether that's a stun gun, you know, gun, um, our, our park rangers, right? Um, but then also we have a, a, not a lot, but a fair number of folks that routinely carry weapons, what could be a weapon, right? They're not carrying it as a weapon, but, you know, they've got a wrench or they've got a utility knife because they're cutting mud flaps or they're, you know, cutting rope or twine or whatever it might be. And those kinds of situations get very uncomfortable when, or, or threatening, right? When maybe you're engaged in disagreement with somebody and, Imagine if we're talking and, and we have a disagreement and I just re reach my hand down and put my hand on the hilt of the knife, the utility knife that I have. 
Well, I haven't said anything and I haven't directly threatened you, right? I'm not saying I'm going to get you or I'm going to watch your back when you go to your car or something. But that gesture is, is threatening in itself. So really be aware of those kinds of things. I'm not trying to make anybody paranoid, right? But be aware of those kinds of things. And if you're one of these people that has to carry a, 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 a tool or a weapon, something that could be conceived as a weapon, even, you know, like a spanner, you know, and, and you reach for that during a conversation, recognize that that really can be interpreted as a threat. Um, and so if you know of, know of these kinds of circumstances, maybe even it's one that's under investigation, please reach out to me um, or Adam or the board, uh, help at sccema.org, I'll put that here. And we need to follow up on that. Um, is there anything else you wanted to offer uh, Donna um, about the, the VTA situation, or um, I don't know if there's much more to, I mean, there's so much more to say, but it would, you know, we could spend hours on it. I just don't, I don't know what else we need to share right now. I would just say, if you see something, say something. And I think a lot of times we discount what we, if we feel an uneasiness, I'm not saying that we want to be on a witch hunt or anything, but you as a supervisor, can kind of see maybe a change in somebody's personality. And if you need help, you know, reach out to EAP, reach out to your supervisors, let your directors know um, that there's something going on. Because I think that's the common thread in these is that somebody saw this and did not feel safe enough to say something. So we want you to feel safe enough to say something. And just so you folks know, somewhat alarmingly, I just got two direct messages needing to stay anonymous that they have something to report. So I'm gonna have to follow up with these individuals um, and see, and, and just be, be aware everybody that, that I need, in order for me to take action, it's fine if you stay anonymous, but I actually do need the specifics of the situation, right? If you just say, yeah, there's a situation at my work that fits that description, I need to stay anonymous. That's fine, you can stay anonymous, but, but I, need, I need to have, where are you working, right? Who's the people involved? Who's the person making the threats for me to follow up on anything? Um, so please, please uh, uh, let me know. Okay, I, and um, please send me your number or email. So if anyone is contacting you with that, please send me your number or email um, so that I can follow up after this call. Um, I'll be able to at least start start the conversation with you later this afternoon. Okay. Thank you, Donna. Uh, next item, classification studies. So we have um, several uh, classifications or several many classification studies underway. Don, I believe you're on the classification committee. Um, those are all chugging through. Um, here is a class study that I want to make everybody aware of because it will impact multiple departments. And this is hot off the press, like this happened yesterday afternoon. Um, and I do need to send out a formal email to the impacted folks, but it's it's all good news. So there's not there's not a reason to say no to this. It's not like I need to check with people. Um, we have a very brave person from over in behavioral health. I'm not going to name that person because I don't know if they want to be named, uh, but who initiated a class study about two and a half, three years ago. And it was just to that for them. And I'm sorry that it took so long to resolve your study. That's why we now have the language where we can move it rapidly, rapidly, within a year, move it within a year and the county's contractually obligated to turn things around. So here's the good news. This individual put in for a study and it was granted, wonderful. So they become the position that they put in for. But because they put in for this study, this particular person was an AMA, which is Associate Management Analyst. It caused the county to look at all AMAs for those of you that are familiar with the AMA spec, it's set with very few of us are, right? But it, it does say that this is a trainee position and you shouldn't inhabit this position for more than two years. Well, I know firsthand many AMAs have been in that position for five, eight years, 10 years. That shouldn't be happening. You should be progressing to the management analyst spec or another spec that's slightly more senior. 
Well, many departments don't have that. They haven't bothered to get an AM management, an additional management analyst spec. So here's what the study findings were. Prospectively, all, all associate management analysts will be alternately staffed as management analysts. And all existing AMAs or assi assistant AMA, yeah, assistant management analysts, uh, associate, associate management analysts will be um, re reformed into an alternately staffed code. So if there's anyone on this call who supervises, manages, is, or knows an associate management analyst, the good news is, is that they will be, after two readings, in an alternately staffed class. P.S. There's about 40 of these classifications throughout the county. So this is a lot of SEMA members that are going to be in line for about a $20,000 raise. It is not the whole series. Um, to Barbara, Barbara, to your question, it is not the whole series. The MA to SMA is not required to be uh, alternately staffed. And just to be clear, the management analyst and senior management analyst roles, those are both separate classifications and someone could conceivably be a management analyst for the entirety of their career. It's not a trainee position. So great news for anyone who's an AMA. And um, also it's good news for the management aides. There are far fewer management aides. There's maybe 20 throughout the county, but anyone who's a management aide, it's one of the lowest paid SEMA classifications. I believe they're at like 62,000, 67, 65,000, something like that. And management aides as part of this one person putting in their class study, they were all studied as well. And it was concluded by the county, correctly so, that management aides are being misused. They're being used as AMAs or MAs, but just paid a whole lot less. So all management aides as part of this study are also going to be alternately staffed on a one-time basis, so one-time only, management aide, associate management analyst, management analyst, okay? However, after this time, this one time shift for that stepping stone, management aides will be a discrete category and the county is supposedly going to be much stricter about using them only for management aid work. So anyway, uh, just wanted to update everyone on this. In total, this is going to impact somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 SEMA represented folks. Uh, about 45 of them are members, so we got to get the other ones signed up. Um, and most of them uh, will enjoy a relatively rapid transition into probably one higher step. The management aides probably won't go all the way to management aides, but they will go to an associate management analyst. Most associate management analysts will move in short order to management analyst. Um, and if you supervise any of these individuals, uh, be aware that you know in, in two readings, two board meetings from now, you'll likely be getting requests. Uh, from them to be upwardly moved. Okay, Barbara, I think I answered your question. Um, David, have the current classification studies been submitted to an HR analyst yet? Uh, I'm, I'm reading into this question, David, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's a reference to the contractual classification study committee and those 30 classes. If, if so, those have been submitted to HR. Um, whether they've been assigned to a specific HR analyst yet, I apologize, I do not know the answer to that question. Adam would know the answer to that They, question. they have not. Um, I think some of them have, but we're in the middle of it and we have one more meeting to finalize the, the list. So. Thank you, Donna. I'm glad you, you know that. Sorry, I was just taking a sip of my coffee here. Okay, uh, see no further questions or comments on this. Um, oh, and, and again, thank you so much to this individual. If you're on the call, you know who you are. Thank you, you did a great job preparing your study. I hope I helped a little bit in that, and I'm sorry it took so long. But you know, one person put in their study and it ends up helping out 60 people. So yeah, that one person had to wait three years and that's inexcusable. I'm glad it's helping out a lot of people. Okay, surveys in process and to come, you know, so there are three surveys out right now. Um, let me put a reminder to send out a, a reminder on that. 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this because survey reminder because we are uh, we already discussed a little bit about it in the um, uh, telework discussion. So as a reminder, that's the next big survey that's going to be coming out. I'm, I'm frankly not that thrilled with how um, I, Adam, Seema rolled out these studies. I, I know that, or excuse me, these, these surveys. When you're hit with three surveys at once, I get it. it you're not likely to fill, either you're like, yeah, I don't want to take three surveys, and you, you close the, the email, or you're like, yeah, I'll get back to it, and then you forget usually you don't sit down and take three surveys at once. So I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask that the board and myself and Adam having observed the, the low response rates on these surveys, that we send them out either combined surveys or send them out one at a time and stagger the weeks. Because you, know, you send out a bunch at once and it, it, the, the response rates speak for themselves. So you have my commitment that we're not gonna do that in the future. Surveys to keep an eye out for, um, the, the big one is gonna be telework. So with telework, we're going to want to understand more about what you want in terms of telework, if it's working for you or not working for you, and then the, um, the general discussion about uh, what types of telework are helpful. Uh, also, I want to draw a distinction. Right now, we've been or I've been talking a lot about telework. We had a robust discussion about it. There's also a difference between telework and remote work. I'm using these terms and other employers use them interchangeably. In my mind, they're not. Remote work is when you're working very far away from your place of employment. And that creates its own unique set of problems, right? We're not equipped to do that. If you're working out of state, the county's paying, you know, disability insurance and workers comp locally. If you're working out of Wyoming, that's illegal. We can't, you know, you can't blow horns about that and you shouldn't be doing it. So um, please, please do not do that. And, and again, remote work is very is different than telework. Telework could mean you could show up to work in an hour if, if needs be. Um, remote work, and yes, I realize some people work live further away than an hour, but generally people are within commute distance. If you're at, you know, Northern California on the border with Oregon, are you still in state and are you violating any laws? No, but gosh, is it going to be hard for you to get into work if something has to happen? And that's remote work, right? That's an example of remote work. If you're down in LA, you're not, you're not really able to, to participate in the community, community events, the community or the employer in a meaningful way. Uh, to Teresa's question, did the survey go out, surveys go out already? The ones that are active are, I'll, I'll look up exactly which ones are. So the ones that are active right now are concerning disaster service work, are concerning, um, uh, work load and some questions on the vaccination process. So those are the surveys that are out now. What have not gone out that I have discussed then will go out is telework. And also um, to the TSS folks that might be on this call, we have our own set of, of surveys to go out about substitution of hard degree requirements for certifications and experience. So for those of you that remember ITCC three years ago, two and a half years ago now, and, and going back beyond that, you remember that there was a big fight about hard degree requirements. The then leader of um, TSS and Duncan really insisted that um, everyone have hard degree requirements. We fought back with the board and maybe about a third, 30% of classifications ended up with hard degree requirements. Now new leadership, Imre Kabai, Anita D'Amato want to see a removal of even those. So then we'd be looking at certifications for most of the codes. So I wanna understand if the, it's three years later, right? The, the opinions of the group may have changed. Okay, Aaron, can we make sure the survey went beyond, oh, wait, wait a minute, sorry, too many things are coming in here. Can we make sure the survey went beyond TSS? All the surveys were unit wide that have gone out right now. If that's a reference to the hard degree requirement, no. Um, it's not gonna go beyond TSS and I'm very firm on this unless the board directs me otherwise. I do not, just like a class study, if we're redoing what a, what a social services program manager one is, I'm gonna talk to social services program manager ones. 
I, I don't care what a roads operations supervisor thinks a social service program manager one should be doing. Sorry, roads operations supervisors, if there's any on the call. Um, it just it just is not appropriate to get intermingled in the other in the other areas. Um, a question a question about the management aid. Will alternate staff as management aid AMA MA? Okay, so this is a question about that chain. I apologize because I gave you got you all a lot of information about this. If you have a management aid right now they will be converted into a, an alternately staffed management aide, associate management analyst, management analyst. So three links in that chain. From then on, any new management aide code will be a standalone management aide code and will not have that connection to the other pieces. I hope that clears that up. And Aaron, um, maybe maybe we should talk privately if you want to see if the hard degrees go to others. But I, at this point, I just don't I don't see that. Uh, Boo asks, "What's the time frame for the telework survey to go out?" Ah, uh, I'd say within the next two weeks. Um, that's going to be that's a loose require loose thing because there's a lot of other moving pieces right now. But I I know it's a priority. I'm not going to be able to work on it until Adam gets back. I have not received any surveys. Were they targeted? No, they were not. Um, please give me your email. Uh, actually, I can just I can just look you up. I'm going to write you down, uh, and I'll make sure that gets out to you. Uh, it, they were targeted to members, so if you're not a member, you won't get it. Um, but I, if you're on this call, you should be a member. And if, if your last name is hyphenated the way that it appears there, um, Teresa, uh, that's how I'm going to be searching for you. Mr. Jones or Grant asks, there are IT people outside TSS. That is true. Um, so I, I, I misspoke. When I said I did say TSS, and that, and that is a misspeak on my part, what I should have said is all technical classifications. So anyone who inhabits a technical code, an IT code, when I say technical, I realize like an architect is a technical code, but um, all IT classifications will be sent this. Um, and yes, there are IT people outside of TSS, very limitedly outside of those budget units that are, that are answered to TSS. But yes, anyone that's in an IT code will be eligible and should take the survey. I uh, gotcha, Aaron, I see what you were saying. They, they will be included. Uh, direct message. Okay, good. I'm glad I could answer your question. Uh, we are called the federal. Yes, I'm, I apologize. I I apologize to everybody who's in the federated staff. I also, if anyone is on the call from the radiology department that's in technology, or that's at SSA in the non federated group, but that are IT workers, I'm aware that you exist. If you work in any of the elected departments, assessor, sheriff, or uh, the DA, you are also federated and part, and you. I value your opinion deeply. Your technical workers. So I hope my example clarified, though, what, what, why I'm not in, why I don't think any of you should be interested about what a janitor supervisor thinks about your minimum qualifications, or vice versa. I don't. You shouldn't have any input on what it, the minimum qualifications for a janitor supervisor should be. Okay. Good. A couple of people private messaged me. I apologize for that misspeak. I'm not trying to exclude anyone from that. I'm glad that cleared it up for you. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next topic, uh, budget process and spending. Okay, so you know what? Let me let me go to the, the auditor move to the CEO's office because that's going to be really quick and I hope that um, I can cover this rapidly. So this is an important topic because the auditor is, the auditors are being reassigned and we've concurred with it and are moving to the CEO's office. Here's the rub. It's a group of about, I can't remember, Donna, was it 10 people? I don't have the figure in front of me, about 10 people. That sounds about right. Okay. Precisely zero of them were SEMA members. They're SEMA represented but not SEMA members. 
So I'm in this weirdo situation where on the one hand, I need to advocate for the unit, but on the other hand, I have nobody that can lawfully respond on behalf of the unit. And we have this problem generally in finance services. Um, it's just a, it, you, nationwide, people who are in accounting and typically IT, we're a little bit of anomaly because we have a lot of IT density, largely because of ITCC, I think. Uh, we have very low density in, in financial services. So what I did is as a courtesy, I reached out and said, let me know what you would like and please, please join up. I believe one person signed up and now we need to follow up. If you know anybody there, don't heckle them, but please kindly reach out and say, hey, it's really worthwhile to be a part of the union. They are moving over to the CEO's office. So just fair warning to everybody, if you work with them on a business basis or know any of them, um, please encourage them to become SEMA members and uh, also be aware that they're moving to report directly to the CEO's office in part so that they can have a, a greater, greater visibility of county operations, but also for more direct control. So that's happening. And I just wanted to share with you that nuance of, well, what do we really do when there is, there's a small unit or maybe it's one or two people being moved, but they're not, they're not in the union. And in this case, it was a courtesy. I could have just concurred or I could have rejected it, but I wanted to get some soundings from the group. So anyway, that's, that is going on. Uh, budget process and spending. Okay, so here is the scoop on, on budget spending. I'm going to share my screen for a second here. There's a process in the budget called inventory items. And what this yields is uh, an opportunity for any elected on person on the board of supervisors to say, um, hey, I want to give $25,000 to the Boy Scout Troop 223 in my community. Um, let me share this. And the challenge with that is it leads to non-RFP ways to distribute money. So you can see what I'm sharing here. Okay, so I'm gonna go up to the top. And here's the, the, here's the rub. You can see that all the, I've, we've, I've organized this by sponsor, who moved it, who it's to, what the reason is. And this is for rhetorical purposes. The answer to these questions is yes. Is this service duplicated by Santa Clara County? Does Santa Clara County already fund or give to this CBO? The answer for column E is almost universally yes. F, maybe 50% of the things here are yes. And you can see they range in amount from maybe $2,000 to as high as $250,000. And this is not a critique of any of these scholarships or not scholarships of any of these organizations. I'm sure they're doing good work. It's in my view, not appropriate at a time when many of us have just gone through VISIP, people retired because they were afraid of layoffs. Um, we've had a two, two rounds of staffing cuts and eliminations. A couple of people have been displaced and in, in SEMA have been displaced and had to take other roles. And then we're told this is a maintenance budget and we got to worry about the, about the county funds. So. The Board of Supervisors, you can see Ellenberg here has a lot. Chavez has a lot. Her total is 772,000, 1,690,000. Uh, Lee has 900, uh, Supervisor Lee has 942,000. And Supervisor Simidian, he goes big but small. Uh, he only has a few, but he went 1,200,000. So for total spending, we're looking at north of $4 million. And it's a significant spend at a time when we're looking at, at budgetary cuts, right? So it's a real mixed message. Historically, the board hasn't really had much pushback on these during fatter times. But now we, SEMA organized a group of labor uh, organizations. Um, at, there's a group called SELA where SEIU, 1587, um, the, the 
uh, nurses, um, the Valley Physicians Group, et cetera, all get together and talk monthly about union matters. SEMA drafted a white paper. Adam did a great job um, drafting a one pager on this. And we're going to jointly present that to the Board of Supervisors. I don't expect that they will cancel their spending. It's been through one reading. I think what it will do is alert them to the fact that we are watching and this is an inappropriate process and it ought not to repeat. Also, so you're aware, some of the names on that list actually went to the RFP process for various agencies. And when told, okay, RFP stands for Request for Proposal, if some of you may not be aware of that. Here's the service you want to provide. Here's the, you know, you need to respond to this request for proposal as to how you'll spend the money and so forth. Several agencies said, that's too much trouble. I'm just gonna go through the inventory process. So they're kind of short circuiting how the county normally pays for services. And with all of these awards, awards is a generous term for it. They're not linked to any service provision. You give $250,000 to a group and they say it's going to be used to help battered women. All right, so you hope that they spend that money on battered women. In a few cases, if anyone cared to review it, you'll see that it's, we're going to give our executive director a raise, $50,000. That's going to give the executive director a raise. And that was approved. In the grand scheme of the county budget, four and a half million dollars is not an incredible amount of money. And I realize how insane that is for me to say. It's not an incredible amount of money because you're talking of a budget, um, depending on how you calculate it, between five and seven billion dollars, maybe even north of that if you factor in some pass through funds. In terms of discretionary budget, you're looking at approximately three and a half billion. And I'm sure someone in finance can give me a better number on that. So there are things that the county's obligated to spend money on that count as part of that budget. And then there are things that the Board of Supervisors can reallocate. So when you have about three and a half billion dollars, four and a half million, is it worth talking about? Absolutely. Is it significant? Is it gonna cause the hospital to go bankrupt? No, that, that, that type of allocation is not. But I just wanna let everybody know your board and your union are keeping track of this. And this is a tremendous argument for us to have in our back pocket when and if they come for more cuts, right? Is it's like, well, just cut your funding to the executive director at insert group here. Okay, uh, I've got a couple of questions here. Let me see that what came in. Uh, confidential one. Yes, someone else needing the surveys. I'll get that to you. Okay, um, Zeb, are you alluding to the internal? Yes, I am. Sorry, Glenn. Uh, I, I, the internal auditors specifically. Yes. Uh, I, I, if I didn't say their class name, I apologize. I, I wasn't intending to be cheeky or allude to them. Um, this is a confusing question to me. Are those Measure A funds? Uh, what are you referring to? When you say those, if you're talking about the, the money that the board just dispersed, that's general fund money. That's not Measure A funds. What was that? Does that? I hope that answers your question. Uh, if it doesn't, please please ask another question. Okay, it did. Great. Okay. Um, sort of an abrupt stop to the meeting. We're right at one. That was the last agenda item. Um, if there are other questions or people that want to hang around for a few moments, I can for about ten minutes. And I'm not going to close out the meeting because I need to go back in the chat and get the names of individuals that said they the two folks that said they had some private matters to uh to raise please if you're one of those people put your information in chat now privately to me so i can contact you more easily okay i'm going to stop the recording now but thank you so much for your attendance and i really appreciate the this is a very um participatory meeting i appreciate all the wonderful questions and thoughts thank you everybody have a safe day thank you donna